Hello and welcome to a brand new Arsblog Arscast right here on Arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Today is a bit of a mental day for me because I'm going to the US tomorrow, today when you're listening to this, but this is Thursday recording this. And I thought, you know what? It'll be grand. Do a podcast. What's going to happen? We're certainly not going to sign any players. The team are going to be traveling to the US. There's going to be very little happening. You know what we'll do? We'll have a good conversation about the the one tangible thing that has occurred this week, which is the appointment of Edu as our technical director. That's a thing that happened. It's real. It exists. So let's talk about Edu. Edu as a player when he was with us. Edu as a football administrator with Corinthians and the Brazil national side. Edu's new job and the kind of influence he might have over the club and our playing style, our philosophy, our transfer business, all of that. Let's have a lovely, nice conversation about that. I can get my bags packed. No hassle. Everything will be hunky-dory. And then we get the news that Lauren Koscielny has refused to go on the tour of America. The club captain has refused to travel with the team and all the shit has hit the fan, as you would expect, because, well, you know, that's that's a bad thing to have happened. It's bad from Koscielny to behave in that way. There's absolutely no condoning that kind of behavior. He has a responsibility as the club captain to fulfill the duties that are expected of him as a player, as one of our most senior players, and as the captain of the club itself. There's absolutely no way you can excuse it or condone it in any way. However, you do have to think about why it's happened. Lauren Koscielny is not somebody who we know as an agitator. This is a guy who has put his body on the line for us last season after coming back from the injury when we really, really needed him week in, week out, when he probably could have done without playing as regularly as he did. He's, he was still suffering from the effects of, A, the tendonitis that's chronic with him anyway, and that traumatic uh, Achilles tendon snap. He didn't shirk his responsibilities. He played at times when he shouldn't have played. And down the years, you know, this is a guy who's got kicked in the head. He's been smashed around all over over the place for nine years he's given the club more or less impeccable service in terms of his professionalism of course like any player there have been ups and downs and there have been some mistakes and and what have you but this is not who Lauren Koscielny is certainly not the Lauren Koscielny that we've known over the last nine years so what has driven him fully aware that he is the club captain to have made the decision not to go on the tour, knowing how it would reflect on him, knowing how it would be reported in the papers. What has gone on? I think we really have to think about it from that point of view. Is it just a case that he wants more money in France? I don't think it is. He's 33 years of age. He's going to be 34 in September. Maybe he wants the security of a two-year contract. Maybe he just really wants to go back to France Uh, But I think there are ways and means of making that happen without resorting to this kind of drastic behavior. And the response from Arsenal, okay, some will say, hang him out to dry. The way he's behaved is unacceptable. Let's just hang him out, name and shame him. That's not really the way that we do things. It's not the way we've done things in the past. Uh, I was put in mind immediately of the statement that Atletico Madrid put out about Antoine Griezmann during the week about his shenanigans with Barcelona. It feels a bit Spanish. It feels a bit Barcelona to me. Is this Raul Senyehi making the decision? But what's gone on behind the scenes to have caused this kind of a breakdown in the relationship and for Arsenal to behave in a way which isn't really the way Arsenal tend to behave with situations like this. Maybe we've been a bit soft in the past, but maybe also there's a good reason to keep things in-house as much as possible. Could Koscielny not have been reported injured or ill? We've done that in the past with plenty of players, where we have dealt with situations behind the scenes without causing an absolute furore on the eve of of our preseason tour or on the eve of a game or, or whatever it might be. So I think there's a lot going on, a lot that we don't know. There's a lot to unpack. There's probably plenty more to come out in the wash. And whichever side of this you find yourself on or whether you're sort of just looking at it in, in wide-eyed bemusement as I am right now, it's not good. 
it's not healthy. It doesn't speak to cohesiveness and cohesion and harmony behind the scenes. It's bad for Kishelny. It's bad for Arsenal. It's bad for Sanyehi. It's bad for Unai Emery. And I'm not pinning blame on, on the manager or the head coach for this. I'm just saying that as a situation for Arsenal Football Club to find itself in so publicly at this point of the summer when when so little else has gone on, it just really doesn't reflect well on what's happening. Obviously, it could all look a lot rosier in a couple of weeks' time, but I think I've been saying that for a few weeks now, where you go, well, you know, it could be better in a few weeks' time. It could be. And then a few weeks pass, and you're going, well, maybe in another few weeks. But uh, all we can do is keep fingers crossed that it is and that this is kind of the low point of what has been a pretty disappointing summer so far. Anyway, we are going to talk Edu in a little while, but obviously the big story of the day was Lauren Koscielny, his refusal to go on the US tour. The ramifications of that are serious for the player and for the club, and with me to discuss all of that and more, including transfers, I'm delighted to welcome back to the show, as always, David Ornstein. Hi, David. Hey, Andrew. How are you doing? Good, thank you. People have been waiting for things to happen this summer. I don't know that this was something anybody really expected. How much of a bolt from the blue has this been, and and what has what has happened? Yeah, I, d- I don't think the um, the situation per se has been a bolt from the blue because uh, this had been brewing behind the scenes. But most of us uh, only found out about it when when the news broke via Arsenal's statement this morning. And in terms of his refusal to um, uh, to travel with the squad to the USA, that has come at, as a bolt out of the blue um, because that news was only relayed to Arsenal uh, on Wednesday morning by Koscielny. He, uh, he informed Unai Emery in a face-to-face meeting uh, that he wouldn't be travelling. Emery was uh, understandably, predictably furious with that. And then um, the news was obviously relayed to Arsenal's head of football, Ralph Sanlehi, uh, and he uh, sent a message to Laurent Koscielny um, expressing the club's um, anger and disbelief and disappointment and, um, and making Koscielny aware that if he didn't travel to the USA, he would be in breach of contract and, and face disciplinary measures. Uh, later on, Koscielny uh, replied, um, uh, emphasising his stance, which we can talk about in greater depth, uh, and, and the position uh, and his feelings. Uh, and then he arrived at London Colney on Thursday morning um, and confirmed uh, that he wouldn't be travelling. Uh, and that's pretty much when Arsenal released their statement, I think, to get on the front foot on that one. So yeah. Arsenal departed at half 12 uh, without Koscielny on the flight. He now will be required to train with the remaining players at London Colney, mainly young players. Um, uh, if he doesn't do that, he'll also be in breach of contract. Uh, and the club are going through the disciplinary proceedings already to establish what punishment or punishments Koscielny will receive. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a, a strange situation in that I think we all understood that Lauren Koscielny might want to leave. There was certainly talk of that last year. His agent was quite clear that, you know, had he not sustained that Achilles injury in the Europa League semi-final against Atletico Madrid, he would have coincided his departure with that of Arsene Wenger or at least attempted to do that. Um, but but Koscielny, in the nine or ten years that he's been with Arsenal, has been a very professional player, a very professional guy. How has it got to a point where the action has become quite as drastic as this, where you know he can't be unaware of his commitments and his responsibilities as club captain, yet he is prepared to refuse to go on tour in order to to, uh, I I guess, facilitate a departure from the club. But, you know, it feels almost, even if it has been brewing in the background, it's sort of gone from 1 to 100 um, in a very short period of time. To explain the situation properly, we need to understand exactly what's happened behind the scenes. Uh, And although I think him not going on the tour has come to a head very quickly, uh, the the wider situation has been brewing for quite some time. Uh, And... 
as I understand it, it dates back to um, uh, his return from the serious Achilles injury in December 2018. Uh, since then, he's become increasingly discontent uh, and unhappy, uh, primarily over issues such as the management of his playing schedule, the Sunday, Thursday sort of relentless slog, and also separately yeah. the direction in which he feels the team and the club uh, are moving and how they're currently operating. He was not the first to feel this way, um, and it certainly doesn't excuse his behaviour, but I'm just explaining uh, his perspective. It also doesn't relate to how grateful he is for um, how Arsenal stood by him during his injury, which I've seen a lot of people complaining uh, about. These are sort of separate issues. However, as Arsenal were challenging to get back into the Champions League, the two parties sat down for negotiations over a new contract that would see... Um, him extend I think I don't know this for a fact but I think it would see him extend uh, by a year on top of the remaining 12 months on his contract I don't think they had finalised how, how long they were looking at um, and I think he saw a brighter future for him and the club if Champions League football was attained however Arsenal missed out obviously in Baku with the defeat by Chelsea and that has changed everything, not just for Koscielny, but for many other players. And of course, it's changed things enormously for Arsenal's recruitment hopes, uh, their plans and their possibilities. So uh, Koscielny went away and, and decided pretty much that it was time to call it a day at Arsenal after nine largely sort of memorable years. Um, with some ups and downs, but time to return to France. He didn't want to be part of, of the club any longer. Um, and so when he returned from his break, he informed Arsenal of this uh, and he thought it could be resolved amicably given his long service and his professionalism up until this point. But Arsenal rejected that idea um, and they were very keen on him being part of um, their plans for next season, a key part of their plans. Uh, Unai Emery was happy with his level of performance last season and they also expected him, quite understandably, to see out the final year of his contract. However, he is of the opinion that somewhere along the line there's been an agreement that would allow him to leave for free this summer. Now, Arsenal dispute that. They sort of cate categorically deny that that was the case. Um, and sort of separately to that or failing that, he thinks that there is an offer on the table or incoming, I don't know exactly what status it's at, that will be acceptable for Arsenal. <laughs> However, complicating all of that is that I've spoken to some people who are aware of these proposals and they don't think Arsenal will deem that um, acceptable. And others entirely say there's no offer on the table, so there's nothing even for Arsenal to think about at this point. So it's a complete and utter mess. And then it all came to a head um, from Wednesday morning onwards. Yeah, I mean, I think complete another mess sums it up, doesn't it? Because we're in a situation where Arsenal this summer have many issues to sort out. Defence is really yeah. one of the biggest ones. And we're in a situation where probably the best central defender at the club is a 33-year-old who's about to turn 34, who is, you know, um, not crippled, but who is clearly affected by an ongoing tendonitis problem, a, uh, a traumatic injury. And you can understand Arsenal's point of view why they would they would want to keep him because it makes it more difficult to perhaps move on some of the other players in defense that they might want to they might want to shift. Um, you know, this is Raul Senyehi's first summer in full charge as the head of football. You know, However people want to look at this and however they want to talk about Koscielny and, and the way he's behaved, and as you say, and I think I'm, I'm on board, you, you can't condone the way that the club captain has behaved. But you do have to question why it is it has come to this and why this thing has been played out so publicly. Very often the Arsenal way is to to sort of not necessarily brush it under the carpet, but to throw a cloak over it a little bit and say Koscielny can't go on the tour because, you know, he's got a back injury or he's, you know, picked up a hamstring problem and it gets dealt with that way. You know, Arsenal this time have gone public straight away with this and, and caused this sort of furore. So 
it, it doesn't really reflect well on anybody, particularly with just four weeks left of the, the transfer window. Yeah, I've spoken to some people today who feel uh, it was very unlike Arsenal and out of keeping with the club's traditions and way of op- ways of operating to have released this. Um, but you can't have your cake and eat it. We're, we're always asking why aren't they coming out and um, confirming what we all knew about Sven Mislintat, about yeah, yeah, Baron yeah. Burgess, about um, the physios who were sacked last summer. Uh, 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 you know, the Ozil contract, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. And then when they have come on the front foot and tried to take control of the situation and, and deny anyone else the chance to break news from across the media and leave them in a potentially even more embarrassing situation. And of course, you'll see he's he's not in the squad because they publish the list and then everyone would be asking what's going on. They would probably maybe historically have said something like he's injured, he'll be staying behind to train. Someone would have got the story and then we would have all had a go at Arsenal for not coming out with the information. So yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think you can win in that situation. It, it, I, and I don't think there's any proven way to deal with those sorts of scenarios. I, I've seen as many people saying today that they've dealt with it well as people that have say, saying they've dealt with it badly. And if we forget the PR as, as well, they need to get on with an incredibly important summer. I mean, you mentioned the defensive side of things now. This is a major headache for them. And it's one that is not of their own making, they will feel, um, despite what Koscielny and, and his people feel about the, the climate and the environment and, and the reasons that have led him to take this decision. Arsenal have um, uh, close to completing a deal for Saliba. It's not final yet because they've got to work through a few final um, finalise the details on that one. But they're close to completing that deal. However, he'll go back um, to Saint Etienne for the entirety of next season, and that's not going to change. He's eighteen year old, eighteen years old, and that's in the plan. So you can write him off for a year. Rob Holding's still recovering from his knee injury. I'm told that um, Konstantinos Mavropanos uh, is not seen as a credible option at the moment that there are concerns over his development and his readiness physically. Uh, I don't know if it's mentally as well, but I, I was just told his development and his readiness to compete for a position now are of concern. And then there's the Mustafi situation, which you and I have spoken about before. Yeah. They've, tried to, they've tried to sell him in the past. They would like to sell him against this summer. In the aftermath and the fallout from um, the Europa League final, um, even Emery, who had uh, backed him in his first season at the club, despite the series of high-profile errors, he decided enough was enough. Just to be clear, that wasn't... I know that he didn't play in the final. People have, have pointed out that he didn't play. It, it was at the end of the season, his reflections, was that Mustafi can go. But Mustafi is under contract until 2021 20, and has no desire to leave. So that one is not going to work. He's going to be staying. Um, they were already looking to recruit in that area to bolster the ranks when it included Koscielny. So this is a major headache. They've still got to sort the winger that they're after, Zaha, which, I, I, as I've reported, um, I think they stand very l- little chance of landing him. £40 million pound offer was, was thrown out by Crystal Palace immediately. £40 million pounds plus you know, reports that they'll throw in the likes of Carl Jenkinson, Mohamed El Nenny, who Crystal Palace turned down last summer, and also um, <laughs> one other player. It was Callum but, Chambers. Chambers. Crystal Palace are not interested in any of these players. They're scoffing at any kind of suggestion that that they'd be interested in taking players like that. Um, so I, I really something enormous has got to change for the Zaha situation uh, to materialise. You'd have to think a major sale or out of the blue, the uh, Cronky family investing some of their own money, which is very difficult to do um, under financial fair play rules. They can invest some, don't get me wrong, but and, and I'm not the, the sort of financial expert on this, but yeah. I, I don't know if they can invest the sort of money that people would like to see them invest under financial fair play rules. Then there's the midfielder that, that they have been seeking for a long time, a box-to-box midfielder, a replacement for Aaron Ramsey. Um, we've seen very little... Um, sort of concrete speculation around that position. Pursuing Kieran Tierney at left-back, that one's gone quiet since they 
their, their initial offer was rejected. And, um, you know, there's an expectation that they'll come back in for him, but I don't think it's moving anywhere at the moment. So if I take this all the way back to the statement and whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, I don't think they really care whether it was a good thing or a bad thing compared to the bigger issues that they've got on their plate involving their captain yeah. and their overall recruitment with the transfer deadline of the 8th of uh, August starting to creep into sight. Um, just going back to the central defensive issue, when you talk about um, Mavropanos not being considered a credible option at this moment in time, that might suggest that he could go on loan somewhere for a year obviously Callum Chambers is somebody who can play but you know if it's a case uh, Koscielny goes um, they don't want Mustafi Chambers is somebody they're willing to offer to Crystal Palace Holding is not going to be fit for the start of the season because he's recovering from his um, cruciate ligament injury which he picked up maybe a month before Hector Bellerin so you know he, he's a little bit further down the road but not quite there to, to start games so that leaves Arsenal with basically one central defender that they want and that's Socrates um, who is 30, 31 years of age do you have any insight into why it is then that Christian Bielik, who played very well for Charlton last season, I know it was in League One, but he helped them in midfield gain promotion to the to the championship. He went away to the European Under-21 Championships, was one of the standout players there. He wants first-team football at Arsenal. Is there the possibility that, um, despite reports this week, that, that Unai Emery has no role for him at the club, that the Koscielny situation might well force that or at least open the door for someone like Bielik uh, to be given an opportunity? That's a great question and it's one sadly I don't have an answer to because every time I pose the Bielik question uh, to people I speak to um, I don't get a response and I don't know whether that's because he's not in in their mind as a a credible option or he is and they just don't want to let on but if that was the case you would start to see him sort of figuring more prominently in conversation Um, usually when they've clubs have high hopes for somebody they're quite happy to talk about them um the word coming from polish journalists is that he's he's given up and that he wants to move on now he would have loved to have made it at arsenal but that he, he's been given no reason for encouragement and in response to your question could they be forced into it now well i, d- I don't really think so because um if the past is anything to go by they'll just turn back to mustafi partner him with um <laughs> <laughs> partner him with Socrates, hope that um, Koscielny sorts himself out and, and plays. Uh, I, I think there's there's a feeling among some that, you know, by Christmas time, the, the central defensive partnership would be Rob Holding, Socrates, Callum Chambers in the mix. Chambers is determined to win a place at Arsenal. I know that much, but clearly from what we've seen um I don't know, just a year ago during the World Cup, I reported that Arsenal um, had big hopes for him and he was set to sign a new contract. He signed that new contract. He then, he then uh, went out to Fulham and uh, I th- some people at the club think it's not going to happen for Callum Chambers, given that at Fulham, the position that he impressed in was not the position that Arsenal would want him to impress in. Yeah. Uh, he, he impressed in a holding midfield role. So... That's a really tricky situation. There are people within the game that have always had their doubts about Chambers managing to establish himself as a top quality centre half. So it's whether the existing um, resources can patch up the situation. You, which you sorry, is just to cut across you, unenviable, or yeah. whether they enter the market and and bring someone in. Well, you with mentioned limited budget. You mentioned Koscielny there, like uh, Socrates, Mustafi, and Koscielny. I mean, do you see? A situation where Koscielny can stay at the club because it feels very much after the way this has all gone down that his position is basically untenable which of course might well be exactly what what he wants yeah um but at the same time you know Arsene Wenger uh, always said like you can't keep an unhappy player a player who doesn't want to be there you don't get the level of performance from them that you need. And at 33, 34 anyway, you know, this is not like losing a 25, 26-year-old player coming into his prime. This is losing a player who is who, who is certainly in the September of his career, if we're going to put that diplomatically. But, you know, is there a possibility that the, the, the fences could be mended? Well, it's looking very difficult at this stage. And the irony of Arsenal 
being honest and transparent and putting that statement out rather than hiding behind say an injury that might they may have got away with and tried to sort the situation out the irony of fronting up means you're right it, it looks untenable now um if he, he he can't be relegated to uh, the reserve, you know the under twenty threes for a season because they're paying him a decent salary. He's an international footballer. Uh, in that sense, it would be much better for the club if he if he leaves rather than not playing. Um, and the consensus I've I've sort of garnered today is that the, the statement going out, but it, it very clearly um, expresses Arsenal's dissatisfaction. But it also ends any hopes of um, the problem being being mended, and the likelihood is that um, whether Koscielny has now sort of burned his relationship with Arsenal as a club and their supporters, the likelihood is that he'll get his way of moving back to France mm. and Arsenal Arsenal reluctantly sanctioning uh, his departure. But you know, we're told there's no offer on the table. So are they ultimately going to let him have what he wanted originally, which was to be released for nothing? Or are the various parties just going to bring some sort of offer to the table so that Arsenal receive an element of compensation for him? Um, are they going to try and integrate their, res- their existing resources with some, you know, some of the younger options like Medley or dip into the market and, and bring in a stopgap for one season with, with Saliba coming in in a year's time if that deal gets finally pushed over the line. You know what, I, I don't have many answers and many people say, oh, you know, why not? Mm. And, and the only answer I can give is that I don't think the club has many answers at the moment. Mm. And they're sort of moving in a, in a very rapid and fluid situation that seems to be changing by the day because, you know, n- not much more than 24 hours ago, they expected Koscielny to be going on tour. Now he's not, and the future of their captain uh, seems to be engraved out. Right. Just one final question, because I really do appreciate the time you've given me this evening. It's it's late in the evening. You've been working at Wimbledon all day. Uh, you know, it, if I don't ask, though, people will go crazy. So yeah. in terms of transfers, is there anything imminent from an Arsenal point of view, inward no. or outward? <laughs> no, no. So Saliba, they need to get that over the line. Um, there are still some small details that need to be finalised. Um, it's more the wording of parts of the contract. Um, and these are usually things that don't bring a deal down. So the agreement seems to be pretty much there uh, with both uh, the clubs and, and the player. Um, so I think now that's really just in the hands of the lawyers. They just need to push that one over the line. Arsenal showed the most concrete and relentless interest. There was late interest from Tottenham, but some politics got in the way of that at their end. So so they um, they seem to have been pushed out of the running. And also Wolves um, were, were very strong on the case, but Arsenal appear to have got Saliba and I hear amazing things about him. So it's, it's clearly a bit unfortunate that, that they'll have to wait a year, but I think all parties deem that to be the right decision. Uh, but aside from that, nothing is imminent, I'm afraid. I'd be staggered if the Zaha transfer comes to fruition. So in that position, they'll be having to look for an alternative option if they still want to go ahead with it. Of course, there's Reese Nelson coming back in, but you know there are some... He's still early in his career. If you watched mm. him in Germany, he had some inconsistent moments. Um He's still got a lot to prove, um, primarily to Unai Emery, who pr- previously in the past had some concerns about him. So they clearly uh, want to bring in, in someone who can provide width. I've seen Malcolm linked. I don't know about the current links with Malcolm, but certainly um, that was a transfer that they had pursued in the past, as we know, and that was a San Lehi led transfer. So it wouldn't be a great shock if they uh, went back back down that route, especially given his links, uh, San Lehi's links to Barcelona and it not being a great first season uh, for uh, Malcolm. But I don't think that's going to be particularly cheap and, and yeah. that doesn't sit well with Arsenal's budget. <laughs> uh, the, the Ryan Fraser situation, I think, I don't know a great deal about it, but it, it was clearly there to be done at the right price and Arsenal don't seem to be able to or want to um, go in at that price. So that that wing situation, a lot of people ask me about Hakim Ziyech. Arsenal have analysed him and he's not a player um, that they will be pursuing. 
uh, as far as I know. I think he would welcome the move. I think um, Ajax would probably sell for around £30 million, uh, but that's that's not on Arsenal's agenda. Uh, the left-back, we know they're primarily focused on Q and Tierney. I don't know any alternative uh, targets. There have been, you know, there are previously names like Moreno mentioned, but he's obviously signed for Villarreal. And, um, you know, Tierney, again, it's a deal that's there to be done, but Arsenal have to get to, to the um, asking price or, or strike a deal. Um, again, with this sort of budget, we're told is around £45 million. Everybody or lots of people say that's nonsense. There's a much bigger budget, but we've got no reason to, to suspect there is a bigger budget. Um, we know that they, like all deals in the industry, will, will operate in instalments. And so, um, you know, they can potentially do some decent business with that this summer. You, you know, say a 10 million instalment here, 5 million there, 15 million there. So there are deals to be done. In terms of the central midfielder, again, lots of names linked. And Lamina most recently, that seems to be one being driven more by the player in his camp. I don't know about it, so I'm not doubting any of those reports, but I can't add to them. Uh, but it's a long way of answering your question that is anything imminent other than potentially Saliba? No. OK, well, look, Arsenal are away on tour in the USA and we'll see. Maybe we'll get some uh, surprises over the next week or so. Um, but David, as always, pleasure to talk to you and thank you very much indeed again for your time. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much to David Ornstein. He was working all day at Wimbledon for the BBC, but still took some time out to talk to us here on the Arscast. So we really do appreciate it. The sound quality, because of where he was, was a little bit hit and miss for a little while at the start. But there you go. That that happens. It's about the information and the quality of the information rather than the clarity of the sound. You can follow David on Twitter at BBC Sport underscore David. This week, Arsenal appointed former gunner, former invincible and former midfielder Edu as our new and very first technical director. He is a former Brazilian international. He's been working with the Brazilian national team and we're going to get some background on him and who better to chat to about anything Brazilian than Tim Stillman. Hi, Tim. Hello there. A few people have asked me uh, on Twitter and maybe on the Discord, the Arsblog Discord server, To talk a little bit about Edu as a player, because they don't really remember him. Uh, He played his last game for us in 2005, which is 14 years ago. So while everybody will have been aware that he was part of the Invincibles, not too many, or not everyone, uh, rather, would have seen him play or understood what kind of a player he was. Um, Did you, were you a fan when he was with us? Because I loved him. I just sort of... I have a thing for left-footed midfielders because they they fill this Liam Brady gap in my life. <laughs> it's uh, it, it makes you feel old, doesn't it? When yeah. you think he left 14 years ago, like where has that time gone? I know. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I did like him. Yes, I did like him a lot. He he never really established himself um, in the first eleven at Arsenal, and I th- he was kind of unfortunate to come. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe unfortunate's overstating it. He still played a really, really big, significant role. Um, you know, won two league titles, I think three FA Cups. You know, that's not a bad haul in four years. And he, you know, he was he had a, a good part in all of that. But he never quite nailed down a starting spot because, you know, this was the era of four four two, and we had Patrick Vieira and Vieira and Edu. That was like offensively, that was a really, really good combination. Mm. But where we had Gilberto Silva, um, who was probably a little bit more important just in kind of keeping the back door shut. Um, in, in this day and age, Edu would, you know, well, of course, he'd walk into our midfield at the moment, <laughs> but probably in any era after the one in which he played, when you moved to more three-man midfields, um, he, you know, he'd have made far more appearances and far more starts. It's yeah. just that we had Vieira and then Edu was this kind of left-footed playmaker um, type. I'd, I'd say, uh, you know, not quite like Granit Xhaka, quite a bit more mobile yeah. um, than Granit Xhaka, although that's, that's a fairly low bar. Um, <laughs> he, but he, was, he, he had a bit of tenacity about him. Like, yeah. He didn't mind a tackle. Um, but I think what most people would remember him for is that wonderful left foot, kind of his ability just to open up the pitch a little bit because yeah. we had two right-footed wingers in Freddie Lundberg and Robert Perez. Patrick Vieira was right-footed. I think our entire, well, no, other than uh, Ashley Cole, all of our 
centre backs and our right back were right footed so he mm. just gave us like he just opened the pitch up um, a little bit with that left foot and he was a wonderful passer and had a, had a really good shot on him so yeah. I don't he, he wasn't quite in the deep lying playmaker role he was he was very much a number eight but um, you, you'd say like he had a, he had a bit of everything really he was um, cultured as all left footed players course, tend to be of course po- poetic left foot and all of that <laughs> but but he, he could put a tackle in and I, I don't think that's something he had when he arrived at Arsenal but it's something he developed and yeah. and actually that's what he started to get into the Brazilian national side in about 2004 they went to Copa America and Copa America usually it's not really taken that seriously and uh, Brazil left um, a lot of their kind of big ticket names at home for the 2004 Copper America and they brought him with them and uh, he kind of got into the team on the basis of the fact that he had quite a nicely rounded game and he mm. could put his foot in and tackle and and unfortunately I think that's why he left the club in the end because he was he was getting kind of more chances for Brazil than he was for Arsenal and I think he really wanted to keep taking that on. Yeah, I mean a lot of people think, you know, he left because um you know he wanted to run down his contract. My understanding of it was that, you know, things ended a little bit uh, unfortunately, in that he was never offered uh, a new contract to sign, so in the final year. But uh, you used the word unfortunate about Edu, um, and I think that's um, we can go back to how he joined the club and and yeah. talk about what a saga that was. Because people who don't um, aren't aware or don't remember, you know, he joined, he came to London and he was sent straight back to Brazil when he got to the airport because he used his Portuguese passport in which um, I don't know how to say this but I guess there were uh, issues or discrepancies Yes, <laughs> uh, perhaps the validity of that document was was questionable um, something which came back to haunt us a bit one summer when all of a sudden Silvino found himself yes. moved to Spain and everyone went what? Why? Why? And then there was yeah. just, there was just nothing doing with that. Um, and he had, uh, you know, some unfortunate events in his life as well. I think his sister was killed in a car crash. When he did arrive, I think his debut lasted about 15 minutes. And he yeah, absolutely, he yeah, he absolutely twanged a hamstring. It wasn't just like, a, oh, I've done my hamstring a little bit here. It was a proper twanger. And he, mm. scored, an, he scored an own goal, didn't he? The, one of his first yeah. contributions was to score an own goal, perhaps against Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough. You know, so the, yeah, first, I, the first few months of his Arsenal career were, uh, unfortunate is a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, he, you know, he'd have been quite entitled, I think, in the summer. of he, he, We signed him in the summer of 2000. If in the summer of 2001 he'd have jacked in and gone home, I don't <laughs> think anyone would have blamed him because he tried to arrive in August um, and the whole work permit thing when he was sent back to Brazil, that didn't get sorted until January. So we didn't see him till January, which is probably why he twanged his hamstring on his debut because he hadn't played and he'd been in Brazil, um, you know, in like November and December, which is their summer. And then all of a sudden he's playing at Filbert Street in the middle yeah. of January. So, um, but yeah, of course he, he had that tragedy with his sister, which which I don't think was very well known um, at the time either. Um, yep, yeah, I, th- I think that Middlesbrough game was his first start where him and Silvino both scored own goals. Um, in that game so and you know he he came into a a team that was that was doing pretty well as well and perhaps you know I I don't say didn't need him but wasn't absolutely crying for him and I think in the summer of 2001 if he'd have decided um, that this just hadn't worked and um, and to jack it all in and to go home and reset I don't think anyone really would have blamed him I think I'm right in saying that Arsenal signed Giovanni Van Bronckhorst that summer as well very similar Mm. type of midfielder very similar job kind of left footed central midfielder and we spent eight and a half million on him so I mean really in the back of Arsene Wenger's mind he must have half given up on Edu to make a signing like that at that expense so for him in that 2001-2 season to kind of really claw his way back into contention and and by the end of the season he was in the starting 11 and I think um, I think that really tells you something about Edu um, that he you know he fought against all of these odds when I don't think anyone would have blamed him if he hadn't to be quite frank yeah and and look he did you know become a very well liked and very popular player there was a great moment wasn't there I think it was his first goal for Arsenal and he sort of 
it, it was almost like, oh God, everything that I went through, now something good has happened. There's this great picture, isn't there, of him? He's sort of on his knees, on his knees with his hands in front of him praying and Gilberto's right there with him. And you'd have to have a heart of stone not to have felt for the guy after everything that he went through. But he did become a really important part of, of that team. You know, if we, you know, people talk about the Invincibles and you think Vieira and Bergkamp and Henri and, mm. and Saul Campbell and Perez, etc., etc. But, you know, the support cast is what really enabled mm. those guys to be as good as they were of course they were brilliant players but you know to have the platform to go and do what they did you need your Ray Parlers you need your Edus yep. uh, in the team who are solid consistent players who, who who will just produce week in week out yeah absolutely and, and Edu um, you know he had some really big contributions I think most people would probably remember him most for the Celta Vigo game in the Champions League yeah. where he scored two brilliant goals but he scored the winner at Stamford Bridge um, in the un, in the Invincible season as well and you know what a huge goal that was mm. in the season and I, I seem to remember during that period actually that he, he'd made his case so solidly, I think he won the Premier League Player of the Month for that month and he made his case so solidly that Arsenal had about a six game spell where we played Gilberto on the right wing <laughs> so that we could accommodate Edu um, into the middle. And, and obviously that. Gilberto wasn't really like a right winger as such. He kind of started on the right and, and you know, plugged in and, and stuff like that. But like Arsene changed that midfield just briefly just to try and get Edu in there. That's that's how well he was playing. Yeah, I remember that actually. It didn't really suit Gilberto, it's it's no. fair to say. Um but look, you know, he left, he went to Valencia, he played some for Valencia, um, didn't have a great time there, I think, because of because of injury. Mm. Um went back to Brazil and played for for Corinthians, which was the club that we we bought him from, and then when he retired, moved into football administration, moved uh, into the executive world of football, um, and he did have a, a spell with Corinthians as their director of football. Yeah, he did, um, and and you know he had a pretty good spell as, there as well. I mean, so. Corinthians were very, very successful during this spell. So while he was director of football, they won, you know, the Brazil Aral, they won the Copa Libertadores, they won the Club World Cup, um, they beat Chelsea in the final for that, um, and they, they brought in a lot of good players, um, and that was that was a big part of his role. Um, but there are there are kind of two characters that that you know tell you that it wasn't just all Edu who on his own. I mean, first of all, Corinthians had a fair bit of money. Um, but they also established a relationship um, with the agent. Oh, God, why has my mind gone blank and I can't remember his name? Which one now? Uh, Kia, that's it. Oh, Sorry. Kia Jorabachian. Yes, yes, yes. So they had this relationship with Kia Jorabachian. You might remember they brought in um, Javier Mascarano and Carlos Tevez as well. That was through Kia. Yeah. Um, and they, they kind of, Corinthians forged a relationship with Kia Jorabachian. Um, and Kia still has a stable of South American, particularly Brazilian players. Um, you might notice that a lot of them go to a certain London club. If I say the names Ramirez, Oscar, David Luiz. Mm. Um, and, but the, the one that's really interesting and probably the one big blot on Edu's copybook while he was at Corinthians, and I'm not sure how much this was really his choice, was the signing of uh, Alessandro Pato. Um, so Pato had, had been AC Milan, he'd been injured, and then frankly, he stopped bothering being a footballer. Um, <laughs> but he was he was one of Kia's uh, stable of players. Um, you might remember that Pato went to Chelsea really weirdly a couple of years ago on loan as well, even yeah. though they clearly didn't want him. Um, I'm mm. not sure how much Corinthians wanted him, but they got him, and they got him at great expense on a massive salary, and it was an absolute disaster. It was... It was like, I mean, it was like the Mesut Ozil contract for us, um, basically. He was a massive, massive disaster for their wage bill, and they spent ages trying to get rid of him. Um, he went on loan to Sao Paulo, one of their rivals, and ended up paying half of his wages. And it was a massive millstone on Corinthians, mm. and it stopped them spending money. And they only just got rid of him um, about two years ago, shortly after that Chelsea loan spell. That Chelsea loan spell was about shop windowing him so that someone would buy him. Um, 
and he, I mean, he went, he to, went to Villarreal. But I mean, Villarreal yeah. are not a club with the kind of money that would. Uh, that no. would yeah, but I guess you know his after that he went to China. Had expired. He went to China after that, didn't he? So yes, um, yes. Yeah, so there you go. Well, yeah. you know, this is a guy perhaps that uh, when we talk about these. Um, recruitment policies whether they're data driven or contacts driven um, maybe there's a lesson there for someone like Edu coming in as technical director uh, that you know agents if they're selling you something it may not be in your best interest it's certainly in their best interest and the best interest of their player yeah. I'll be very curious to see how this dynamic works out with, with Raul Sanyehi who is of course you know uh, uh, um, a schmoozer that kind of a guy he is more um an agent-led recruiter, yep. or as far as we know, he has done fuck all this summer. So you know we're still shooting around the dark. And a bit. it will be it will be very interesting. Uh, and I should say that the Kia link up for Corinthians was more good than bad. It was just that Pato one was really really bad. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if that's rekindled because Kia still mm. has a massive stable of South American players. And um, yeah, it will be interesting to see if 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 that's what Raul sees in Edu um, a link to another the super agent it, it might be it might not be but i think that's something to keep an eye on yeah i mean certainly you know the the links to um brazilian players uh you know if we start to see more and more of those happening then you know you wouldn't be at all surprised obviously because nope. of the the kind of um uh, connections that, and knowledge of course that edu would have of that local market yeah this and this is one of the ironic things talking talking about edu's passport yeah. one of his jobs so his his other his big tie up is Chite, uh, the Brazilian coach. So when um, so he was, they were together at Corinthians. When Chite was appointed um, as the coach of Brazil, he was the only candidate because he's the only half decent Brazilian coach. So he had a lot of leverage when they came cap in hand to him. Mm. And one of Chite's conditions was, I must have Edu with me. He must be with me in this role. So they got rid of the other guy and they got Edu in. So those two, like, they've been a package for for quite a long time. And so this is a big challenge for Edu now. Because because um, he's he's cut that tie, and I imagine that was part of the attraction, him trying to make it on his own. Yeah. But um, the, one of his big roles for Brazil was um, lots and lots and lots of Brazilians have dual nationality, and one of the things that started to happen was a lot of these guys started to declare for other countries. And this isn't something Brazil had had to worry about before because they've had, um, I'm not talking about Brazilian people here, I'm talking about Brazilian FA. They've had this arrogance that we've won five World Cups, we don't chase players, they come to us. When we call players up, they, they die yeah. to play for us. Why wouldn't you play That's for Brazil sort of thing? Exactly. Now that, that stopped happening because A, Brazil aren't as big a superpower as they once were, and B, as we can see with Martinelli, Brazilian players are leaving the country younger and younger. So they're losing that connection to their country very, very early. Mm. And there are some big cases that really hurt Brazil. The first one um, is uh, Thiago Alcantara, um, who, who played at Bayern Munich. His dad won the World Cup with Brazil and he still didn't want to play for them. He declared for Spain. That was a player they really wanted, a player they really needed in the midfield. Even Jorginho, who plays for Chelsea, um, that this is exactly the type of player Brazil had missed for a long, long time. And he declared for Italy because he'd been in Italy for so long, hadn't been back to Brazil and he didn't really feel that connection anymore. But the one that really hurt them was Diego Costa yeah. because he had a he had a straight choice between Brazil and Spain and he chose Spain, even though he feels Brazilian. When, when his career ends, he'll go back to Brazil. That's where he is every preseason. So he chose Spain because he thought they were better. So Brazil kind of made this decision. We got to stop this from happening we've got to get to these guys when they're younger and make them feel involved and convince them there's a pathway to the brazilian national team so this was a big part of edu's role and this is where i think there'll be an interesting transferable skill to the role he'll be asked to do at arsenal because what he was asked to do at brazil was identify these guys who've got dual passports again ironic for edu <laughs> yeah. that his massive knowledge base is Brazilians with actual dual passports. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and I think that's going to be one of the things he's asked to do at Arsenal is to kind of convince, you know, work with people like Freddie Lundberg and Per Mertesacker and identify a pathway 
into the first team for some of these young players. And that's, that's very much what he's been doing for Brazil. So, um, you know, I know, I know you wrote the other day about um, whether or not Mart- he was involved with Martinelli. Maybe, maybe not. One decision I'm sure he would have been quite involved in is the decision to move Freddie Lundberg into the first team coaching setup. And I think that's another thing to keep an eye on. If Arsenal are really serious about, um, you know, through financial necessity, absorbing some of this young talent into the first team, I think that will be a big part of Edu's role. Yeah, yeah, potentially. I think that there's there's a bit more to come out in the wash about the Freddie Jumberg, uh Steve Bold, uh, mm-hmm. job swap thing, if you like, in that I think the two men who swapped jobs were the key drivers behind that happening rather than uh, the club itself making a decision or certainly Edu uh, making a decision. But that's that's sort of by the by. Um, we, we can touch on um, what he's about to do and where he's about to go, but, but working with the Brazilian national team... Um, you know, I think in general, from what I've read, uh, he was pretty well regarded. There were a few moments which didn't go particularly well for him. How would you assess his, his work with them overall? Yeah, yeah, pretty good. I mean, um, again, it's difficult to separate him from the coach, Chite, who obviously has to take most of the credit, but yeah. they were in complete disarray um, when he took this job. They'd been knocked out of the Copa America in the group stage, um, in 2016, they had an awful manager. Morale was really low. They had an awful coach and things turned around instantly. Um, now, Edu, you know, you, you probably asking yourself like, but how much like who else is like a general coordinator for national teams? Like it's, it's just a job with very little profile. I'm not even sure I know who does that for England, um, if anyone. Yeah. Um, but for Brazil, it was so high profile because Chite made sure that Edu was high profile. So when the squads were announced, it was Edu that did the squad announcing and things like that. And he spoke about the philosophy and he talked about, you know, when there was a year to go to Copper America, he was the one who told the press, you know, look, for the first, you know, for the next few months, we're going to pick quite young squads. We're going to try some players out. And then as Copper America gets closer, we'll get more experienced and, you know, we'll start preparing for that. So Chite put him front and center um, in the spotlight. And, and that's why his job was so high, high profile. Mm. And I, I don't think he really, Edu had a real, you know, I think he made that job his own a little bit because the role became so much bigger when he came into it under, under Chite's insistence. You know, he was given free reign, and but he he was given quite a nice scenario where Brazil were at rock bottom, and the CBF had to basically do everything Chite said. Yeah. So they 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 were very weak, and Edu and Chite were very strong, and they were kind of saying, look, we'll do things this way, otherwise we're not taking the job, and and so they they had the power. Um, but o- overall, I would say that um, he's certainly done a decent job. He goes out having won the Copper America. Yeah. Um, on Brazilian soil, um, which, you know, uh, in, in Brazil, the, um, the, the kind of, it's looked upon slightly more harshly, but analysis in Brazil of the Brazilian national team begins and ends with the world cup. Um, it's a bit like Real Madrid and the champions league. It's just, if you don't win the world cup, shut up and go away. We don't care about you. You know, we're not going to analyse why we didn't win the World Cup. Win it or shut up and go away. And if you don't win the World Cup, you're you're basically nothing. So, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to pretend that like the Brazilian public um, were in love with the job he did simply because they didn't win the World Cup while he was doing it. So. Yeah that's kind of the end of it but that's, that's, i think looking at it from a more objective eye i think he did a good job okay well you know to have some strength of character as well to take on not take on necessarily the the Bra- brazilian fa but to be insistent about what you want hopefully you know that will will work in his favor with arsenal and he has arrived really really quickly mm-hmm. um following the following the copa america um I wasn't necessarily expecting him to come quite as soon as he did. Certainly some people had said to me that he might not be arriving until a little bit later in the summer. And even though there is still four weeks of the transfer window to go, I feel like his influence over what we do this summer is going to be limited. I know there's probably been some back channel communication, a bit of planning and and what have you, but just in terms of him coming in and 
doing the job of technical director as specified in in the you know what the club said the technical director was and and the duties that he would perform you know he's going to need time in the job he's got to get uh, a proper assessment of of all the staff that he's working with the scouting staff the football staff the contract staff playing staff um you know the academy working with Per Mertesacker um all of that stuff is going to take time so him coming in now while I'm glad he's on board it just feels a bit to me like they're getting as many hands on deck at what I guess could be perceived as a difficult time given what we've done in the transfer market so far this summer is so limited yeah so I I think there's a few interesting things about that first of all I'd say that his impact this summer will probably be negligible Um, and I, I reckon the club would you know, obviously, the, like you say, they'll want as many hands on deck as possible. But really, the technical director, like Edu won't be judged on this summer. The technical director is about what happens in 5, 10, 15 years time. It's it's the real thousand foot view. Edu, I think, will begin to be able to judge him perhaps when Unai Emery goes and we see what the succession planning is because the way I'm reading this is that what Edu is in charge of is, say, like the playing style, the philosophy, what type of players are we identifying, where are they in their careers, what kind of contracts do they have, mm. um, what's their pathway with us, where can they where can they get games and make their way into the team? And and that will be with the academy as well as perhaps identifying young talent. So really his, his job, his, his work, I think will really start to take shape when we get a new manager, um, which I think might be next, next summer. Um, If not, then not too long after that. So I don't think he'll be super hands on in, in transfers and whatever transfers we've got planned now, I'm sure they're just, they're all planned and that's it. And they're just trying to do them. Mm. I think Edu, Edu's role will be a much more thousand foot role. Like what are we going to do when Emma is not here anymore? And we haven't, when we've got another manager and, and, and I think Edu's arrival in that respect, perhaps puts some um, some good pressure on Unai Emery because um, there are two things perhaps we could have complained about last season. One was not um, kind of inculcating the young players well enough. The other one, the, you know, the common criticism is what is our style? What is our playing style? Yeah. That's part of Edu's brief. That's, so I would imagine he's going to have to answer to Edu on that at yeah, this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about that. And, and we know that Edu is going to, to the US. Uh, he's going to be on the tour, uh, which leaves or has left by the time this podcast goes out. We're recording a bit earlier, but uh, the team traveling to the US on Thursday, Edu is with them. You mentioned to me that he's probably going to hook up with the Cronkies, which mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense if Raul Sanyehi or, or whoever is going out there... They are going to be in Denver um, and L.A., which is, you know, Stan's stomping ground. So he could be involved in that. But I am really curious to see what kind of influence he is going to have over, essentially, without, you know, uh, being too obvious about it, the technical direction mm-hmm. of the club. Because, you know, he, he came from Brazilian football, which, as we all know, has its own sort of style and flair and panache. Um, uh, he came to Arsenal went into probably the best Arsenal team that any of us have ever ever seen. Um, won t- the double, went through the uh, season unbeaten. We played amazing attacking football, but with an edge. You know, there was a yeah. there was a steal to to this Arsenal or to that Arsenal side that certainly isn't present in the one that we have at the moment. You know, there's a there's a gap in quality and there's a gap in character and a gap in mentality. So I'm really curious as to see what kind of impact he will have. It's not something he can um, turn around in three months or by standing up, you know, in the dressing room and giving a speech. Um, You know, it's not that kind of a thing. But over time, you know, your recruitment policy um, can can really have a big impact on that. So you're you're looking for players who can do um, things on the pitch, but who also have the character and mentality to be able to cope um, with, with the challenges, which is where I think we currently fall down that that once we come out of our um the nicely made bed we find it uh, very difficult yeah abs- absolutely and um uh, 
another thing to say about his spell in Brazil as well. Chite has a very particular style of football. Um, there's not a lot of panache about it, to be quite honest. It's it's quite functional, but hugely effective. Um, if he could speak English, I, I do think Chite would make probably the perfect Chelsea manager. Um, it, <laughs> it's kind of that, that kind of football. It's not that easy on the eye, but super effective. Um, but yeah, he, he has a very particular style of football and he instantly got Brazil playing that style of football and he was calling up uh, players who'd played for him at Corinthians, players who weren't the best players like uh, Paulinho, um, who's who's considered a bit of a joke in this country and not just because he played for Spurs, but because he played badly for Spurs. Mm. Um, but he's, he's actually a quite a decent player, but he fits Chite's style. And so even though he's not one of the best Brazilian players, they called him up because he knew how to play under Chite and they called a few players up like that. Um, and so again, he he has had this experience of going from one place to another and kind of picking up a style with him. Now again, obviously he doesn't have Chite with him this time um, to do that. So he's, he's going to have to come up kind of with his own ideas. And the other challenge is, like we say, he's got a manager who perhaps doesn't really have a style or doesn't really want to settle on one. Um, and I think Lewis Ambrose made a really good point on this podcast a few weeks ago about that can make recruitment quite tricky. Um, if, if you're, you know, because Edu's going to go to Emery presumably and say, right, what kind of football are you going to play? And then we'll know what kind of player to try and get you. And Or you know, do you think it could be possible that that Edu might say to Unai Emery, this is the kind of football we want you to play. These are the players that you've got to do it. Is I mean, is do. that, you know, it could cause friction, I guess. It could. I, I think it could. I think it's likely that it will. Um, to be honest, I think, um, you know, there, there have been a lot of misgivings over, you know, probably 10 years ago in England, even, you know, this kind of whole technical director, director of football, everyone kind of thought, really, like, what's this about? And the, and the reasons that people kind of doubted it are actually still quite valid, i.e., well, what if the manager doesn't agree? Like, those those yeah. those risks are still there, um, and and so the risk is still there this time. Whether it's a risk or not, because you could argue, well, if Emery, you know, if Emery doesn't agree, then he's disposable anyway. And that's the kind of model we're moving towards here. It's we're setting the direction and you must fit into it. But I, I can imagine if I were a coach, I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't like to no, be yeah. told, yeah. You you have know, you're to going this. to play yeah. this style. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but, but you I can mean, understand why the club wants that. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if you go to Barcelona, you know you're yeah. going to have to play a certain kind of football. You're not going to be able to get away with playing like crappy defensive football at Barcelona because it's the ethos of the club. And I think that's something that, that was interesting when Sanyehi was talking about what the role of technical director was. It's like, you know... Uh, making clear what the club's strategy is in the medium to long term. And it feels, you know, even under Arsene Wenger in the last couple of years of Arsene Wenger, we sort of lost our way a bit in terms of the kind of football we all thought thought Arsenal would play, you know, mm. because Wenger's style and his attacking philosophy is really easy to get behind when it works. You know, yeah. it's it's more difficult, of course, when, when things don't go that way. But, you know, even at even uh, when we talk about the executive um, bumps in the road that we've had, like Sven comes in, Sven is gone. Ivan takes over, Ivan's gone. Uh, you know, we, we still haven't uh, uh, officially announced a, a head of recruitment, even though there's stuff going on behind the scenes. You know, it might take, and I think you, you wrote about this um, mm. a couple of weeks ago on, on the blog, that... It might take us a little bit of time to get the right combination. Um, you know, think of it like uh, one of those machines that you put 10p in, and if you get three hearts, you get, you know, money out. What do you go? Slot machines. Slot machines, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, you can be pulling for ages, and you've got like a, a bell and a heart and a spade when you want three hearts. So it might take us a few pulls of the slot machine to get the right the right mix. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I don't think it's a massive coincidence that, you know, guys like Edu and Freddie Lundberg um, have come into it. I was slightly alarmed by the, the statement on the website where Raul Sanye, he said, most importantly, Edu, you know, is an Arsenal man, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, mm. that, I, I hope that's just PR bluster because that is not the most important thing. No. 
And, you know, frankly, Edu, he, he played for us for four years, like four very good years, but he's far more a Corinthians and Brazil man than he is an Arsenal man. The important thing is he's done this job before and he knows what he's doing. Um, but but kind of on that, I, I suppose as a kind of side point, isn't it weird how we all pine after these kind of former players uh, to come into the setup? And, you know, if you're talking about the Invincibles, it's like, oh, Henri, Vieira, Bergkamp, um, a bit earlier, Tony Adams. Mm. Maybe people in the 80s were saying, oh, bring Frank McClintock in. But then it's guys like Liam Brady. And then um, George Graham, who no one thought would be a manager, and Steve Bold and Freddie Lundberg and Edu. Yeah. It's, it's always like the people you least expect yeah. that actually <laughs> end up doing it. But yeah. I, I do think that part, definitely part of the attraction is that Edu played in a team, not just that was successful, but like you say, had an identifiable, identifiable style and had an idea. Um, and, you know, Edu and Freddie Lundberg as players were two guys who fitted into both sides of that Arsenal team in terms of they had the technical ability, but they had the steel and the kind of the mentality and they bought into that side. And they were guys who were not from London, you know, who were imported from their home countries, but really got Arsenal quite quickly. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of probably what arsenal are really driving at here yeah um i think that's uh, true of mertesacker as well isn't it because he was somebody who who instantly and immediately got what the club was about and and how to connect with people and how to connect with fans yeah absolutely absolutely and and you know and obviously i do most importantly has has a has a track record here i i would say kind of as a side point as well another um part of the reason he might have come in so quickly i I don't think his family are going to come with him. Um, now, when he when he was doing the role for Brazil, he had to live in Rio and his family lived in Sao Paulo. Um, now, obviously, Brazil is a massive country, but obviously Sao Paulo to London is, is slightly further we're talking about. But um, they, they didn't go to Rio with him. His son is actually in the academy at Corinthians at the moment. So I don't think he'll want it to take him away from that. I think he's about 15 or 16. I think his daughter is as well, actually. I'm, I'm not sure if it's as, sim- as, as serious as she's in the academy, but she plays and she plays to a good level. So maybe right. Arsenal women will have their first Brazilian uh, player <laughs> out of this. But but yeah, he might have also come over so quickly because I, you know, at least initially, um, his family might not come with him. Um, maybe that, you know, maybe they'll see how it goes for six months to a year. And if there's a reasonable expectation that he'll be here for, you know, for the long haul, they might come over afterwards. Right. OK. Well, look, we'll wait and see. He's obviously got a big, big job on his hands. There's a lot of expectation that's coming with him as well, because we we can all see that there are many things that need to be fixed and and things that we would all like to see put right. Um, how much of that is going to fall on him remains to be seen. But I think we all wish him uh, the, the best of luck because he's got a, he's got a hell of a lot of work to get through. Uh, yeah. Tim, we better leave it there. Thanks a million as always. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed to Tim. You know where to find him on Twitter. He is at Stilberto and read his column, of course, every Thursday on arsblog.com. I should point out that we did have that conversation before all the Lauren Koscielny stuff went down. So Edu's job, which was already quite difficult, has become even more challenging. So I wish him even more luck than I wished him in the first place. Now, just a couple of bits and pieces because I am going to be away from tomorrow. I'm going to be in the States covering the the tour, uh, covering the U.S. preseason tour. I'll be at the games in L.A., in Charlotte, and in Landover outside Washington, D.C., where we play Bayern Munich, Fiorentina, and Real Madrid, doing lots of stuff for Arsblog News, but also doing an exclusive tour diary for our Patreon members. So if you're a Patreon member, you'll get access to this, uh, this extra bonus content. Uh, Andrew Allen and Tom are going to keep the blog ticking over while I'm away, so there'll always be a blog uh, for you first thing in the morning as always uh, with all the latest news and opinion and what have you but if you want a bit more if you want some behind the scenes stuff from the US tour pictures probably a couple of little small podcasts maybe some video stuff and and some articles you can join uh, at patreon.com forward slash arseblog it costs a fiver a month and you get instant access to everything that we have on there and all the other benefits that are coming for example later this summer the arseblog apps will be ad free if you log in with your Patreon details so that's a an extra bonus 
bonus thank you for our Patreon members as well. To join, just go to patreon.com forward slash arsblog. Also to mention that on Sunday, if you're in LA, we are doing a live Arscast from the underground in Hermosa Beach. Arsenal in LA.com have details on the tickets there. It's going to be myself, Elliot from the Arsenal Vision podcast. Also, James Benj from Football London will be there. We're going to have a panel discussion. We'll do QA. So if you fancy coming down to that, uh, go to Arsenal in LA.com and you can pick up tickets there. Hopefully, see lots of you there. Uh, I guess there's going to be a whole pile of stuff going on uh, over the weekend in LA before the game. Um, there are other events going on later in the tour, which I'll give you details of, but they're in Charlotte and also in in Washington, D.C. I'll give you some details of those uh, on the podcasts. The podcasts will continue as normal, as much as possible. Time zones will mean that the uh, publication of the podcast might be delayed here and there, but James and I will do an Arsecast Extra on Monday. Uh, depending on travel and depending on what's going on, there'll be a Friday Arsecast. It might be a Thursday Arsecast or a Saturday Arsecast, but I'm going to try and keep the podcast going as much as possible just to try and maintain some semblance of normality in what appears to be a an increasingly uh, crazy summer from an Arsenal point of view. As ever, thank you very much indeed for listening. Really do appreciate it. I will catch you on the next one or catch you on Patreon. I'll catch you somewhere. Maybe catch you on Venice Beach in LA. Beefcake. Until then, take it easy. Cheers. Bye-bye. So as I was explaining to you, we have very good plan to to bring in the players that we view as necessary to get this club back to to where it needs to be, which is of course in the Champions League, because that's where all the big money is. And of course, once you get in there, then you go to European Super League, and after that, is squids in for everybody. Apart from fans, of course, but that's not the most important thing right now. One other strategy, key strategy that we have is... Excuse me, uh, yes, yes, come in. What? 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 Sorry, sorry, I have to cut the interview short here. All of our players are holding each other hostage, demanding outrageous things. But don't worry, it's all part of a, a very good plan. Very, very good plan. How the fuck are you gonna talk yourself out of this one, Raul? 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 